Our theme for this year here at Parkwood Gardens is to be faithful Christ followers. And we're excited about that. How do we be faithful to the Lord? How, how does that happen? Well, Jesus, in one of the greatest passages in the whole Bible, his longest talk is from the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, three full chapters. And he starts it off by talking about what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are these kind of people. These are the people that God can use, the faithful ones that God can bless. So we want to talk about that here this fall for the next eight weeks. Eight weeks on just 12 verses. So you know there's a lot in there that we're going to pack, unpack one by one. Now before you uh, take out your study sheets, let me ask you a question. If you were to interview a thousand people and ask them what they want more than anything else... What do you think they would say? Happiness, absolutely. And, of course, lots of studies have been done. And near the top of every list, people say, I want happiness. Now, they might mention things that they might think would make them happy, right? But happiness is the number one thing people say. Now, there's a problem with that, though. The problem with that is that if they went to their dictionaries and they looked up what happiness really means, they would find that it's actually quite inadequate. Happiness is actually pretty inadequate. So I've got another question for you. Finish the statement. I, ready? Here we go. I would be so happy if, how would you finish the statement? If my cold would go away. That's right. All right. What else? Who's got another one? I'd be so happy if my troubles would go away. Yes. If my mortgage was paid off. Right? If I had a brand new red Ferrari. I'd be so happy. Right? What would you say? If the people at work were not so... Yeah. I mean, if, if I won the lottery. How, seriously, how many people think that? All the people that waste their money buying the tickets. They would all say, I mean, isn't that their whole point? I'm going to make these millions of dollars and I'll be happy. Wow. Well, let's talk for a moment about blessed people and what happiness really means. If you have your notes and your study guide here, you want to take that out, walk with us. Happiness comes from the word hap, which means luck or chance. Actually, it means good fortune. You got your pen handy? Good fortune, pleasure, contentment, joy, delight. Indeed, we have the words happen chance and happenstance from those, which gives us an idea that it's, it's about, well, things that may or may not happen. Luck, if you will. All right? Circumstances all around you. Happiness is an occasional lucky gamble or maybe, you know, things that are there that we may have and the person next door doesn't have. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a red Ferrari. I used to think about that often when I was going through the change, you know. (laughs) And I suppose there's nothing wrong with winning the lottery as long as you divvy it up with all your friends and tithe 50%. That's Okay, 60. I'm... I'm not partial here. There will all, but the definition of happiness, happiness means pleasure that comes from my circumstances. If this happens, I'm happy. If it doesn't happen, I'm not happy. If I get this, I'm happy. If I lose it, I'm unhappy. Happiness has to do with the external and your surroundings, all right? And so there's a problem with that. There will always be anxiety and insecurity if you're looking at happiness because it's based on circumstances and things that are outside of yourself and they'll always be outside of your control. So the Bible actually doesn't talk about happiness very much. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't talk about happiness very much. Now, some translations have the word happy at the beginning of every one of these Beatitudes, but it's actually a, an unfortunate translation. Because we're going to see the difference between happiness and blessedness as we introduce right now these coming eight weeks. If your translation said, happy is this person, happy is that person, I'm, I'm sorry, because it's actually kind of not a 
the best translation. It doesn't capture it. Now let's talk for a moment about blessed and what it means. See, people might say often, you know, God bless you. And I, that's all right. And I actually end a lot of my emails with God bless. But really what we should say more is, may you be the kind of person and in the place where God can bless you. Can God bless everyone? No, if you're out there robbing a bank, God's probably not going to bless that. Not what he wants. May you be the person in the place where God can bless you. Now, the word blessed here is a Greek word, makarioi, all right? Makarioi. And it's, it means much more than just, well, happiness. Here's what it means. It, it's to be consecrated to be sacred, right? It's things that are holy, that are divinely favored by God, blissfully contented. Those are all part of it. That's what we want to study over the next weeks. These eight things we're going to look at, these conditions, being in the place, being the person that God can bless, that's what Jesus is talking about in the eight Beatitudes that we're going to be studying. So basically, the word blessing has more of the idea of contentment that's self-contained. That's from God, that's inside. It's pleasure or contentment, in your notes, that's self-contained. And so it's kind of the opposite of happiness, because happiness comes from the, help me, outside, and blessedness is from God, and it's on the inside. Now, we're going to talk this morning about the first of the eight ways to have that blessedness on the inside rather than just happiness, which comes and goes on the outside. See, there was, there was an island off of Greece, an island that was with the same name here as this, Makarioi, an island that was the same, beautiful, peaceful, tree, lush island, and people loved it and looked for it longingly, and it was actually with a K first, K Makarioi was the island. And people would say, if only I could get to that that wonderful, self-enclosed paradise, Makarioi, that island. Now, the closest word that I could find in English that matched that was Maui. Yeah, you got it. There's the life, right? You're there in that island away from all the stuff and all the pressures and all the external stuff. And perhaps... Perhaps the people that Jesus was talking to had visited the island or had seen it, you know, 80 miles off the coast, and and they had said, now that would be living. I mean, to be away from all the stuff, all the circumstances of life. You get it? See, that's the picture of blessedness. Blessedness. God wants to give you an inner island of contentedness, of joy that's just... You're content. You've got, it's, there's happiness there too, but it's deeper and more foundational and more lasting than that. That's self-contained, apart from all the stuff going on outside. Now, God's people use this word to actually describe God as well. That God himself is self-contained, right? He doesn't need anything else or anybody else, but he wants to have fellowship, which is why he made us in the first place. God wants to give this to us us as well, this blessing that he has. And whether or not we have the... See, happiness is not blessedness. Blessedness is there whether or not we've got the ultimate car or the nicest house, or whether or not this friend is faithful or whether he stabs us in the back. It's not based on all the stuff, but on something within, something that the world can't take away from you. Indeed, when Jesus told his disciples he was going to the cross, he was going back to heaven, he looked at them and he said, you are going to experience grief when I leave, but no one can take away your inner joy. Yes, Lord? (laughs) You'll experience grief when I leave. And were those disciples upset? Absolutely. Thankfully, he could call them back. But No. You're going to have an inner joy even though I go to the cross. You've been following me every day for three years. So if you could choose, here you go. So do you really want happiness or blessedness? See, there's the question today. 
And this is what we need to understand before we even begin. Do I really want happiness, which is up and down, dependent on all the outside stuff, or do I want blessedness from God, which is there all the time, regardless of what goes on in the outside? So there's the big question. Here, here's a deep example of this. Way back when uh, Lynette was pregnant with one of our kids, we had uh, friends of ours that were also pregnant, but they lost their baby, and they were devastated. I mean, completely devastated. Eventually, they separated. Eventually, they divorced, and, and that was a part of it. And I remember at the time, Lynette and I looking at each other and just talking about this, and, and what if we were to lose this baby? Would we still be able to look each other in the eye? Would we still be able to have peace? Would we still be able to have a foundation that isn't crumbling because of this tremendous loss? And that's blessedness. If you're able to still have that foundation and still have the peace and contentment, even though there's grief there, true? Even though there's deep sorrow, do I still have a foundation that's what blessedness is. And I think a lot of us would say, I want God's blessing, for sure. And we would say, God bless me. But then right after that, we say, and now here's how I want you to do that. Don't we? Because this is what we want. So Jesus said, this is how you get blessed. And in these eight weeks, we're going to look at the ways Jesus said, you can be the person I can bless. You can be in the place where I can bless you. And actually, this blessing describes Jesus. And it describes mature Christians. Now, let's actually read these Beatitudes together. And we're going to do this uh, interactively, okay? So uh, here's the intro. And then when we get to the Beatitudes, we'll have this side read the blessed are. And then this side will read the for theirs is. Okay, you ready? All right, let me read the intro. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. This is in the north shore of the Sea of Galilee and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, ready? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's all read these last two together. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God, I pray that you would teach us today and in the next seven weeks as well about how to be blessed. And Lord, when we're blessed, then it's much easier to be happy. So teach us how to be the people you can bless, to be in the place where you can bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, these Beatitudes that we just read describe Jesus as well. And they also describe mature Christians. If you don't have these qualities that we just read about in your life, you're not a mature Christian. I'm sorry to tell you. You're not mature yet if these qualities aren't there. These are avenues of God's blessing. And if you want God's blessing, his blessedness, that, that self-contained joy and contentment, you need to get serious about God. Not, not just a little trickle, but if you want the flood of God's blessedness and blessings in your life, you need to be serious. See, a lot can happen. You know how to let it happen. You'll know how to take seriously God and take to heart what we're going to talk about these next seven weeks. If you, and if you miss it, by the way, I mean, do catch it online or grab the DVD uh, with our new 4K camera, the 
quality is much better online. Even the DVDs are uh, much higher quality. So I encourage you to do that as we walk through it. Now, the first beatitude we're going to look at this morning is this. Say it with me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about, for instance, the meaning of the word poor, okay? Poor in spirit, the meaning of the word poor. Now, there are actually, now some of you are already saying, you mean blessing has something to do with being poor? I'm turned off already. Wait, I came on the wrong day. I don't want to be poor. Well, honestly, if God were to ask you if you wanted to be rich or poor, what would you say? I would say rich. I would say rich. What are we talking about here? There are two words used for poverty in the New Testament. Okay, there are two words. Now, the first word is penne, and of course, we have pennies, right? So the first word is penne, and penne means a poor man who has to work hard for a living. Now, Jesus uses this in a story. He talked, well, it was more than a story. His disciples went to the temple. They saw rich people pouring into the alms box, you know, lots out of their abundance and wealth. And remember, he watched as one poor little widow, hardworking, worked so hard for all she had, just took two Canadian pennies. She took two little pennies and she put them into the box. And Jesus says, wow, she gave more than all the rest. And the disciples are going, what? She gave two cents. Are you kidding me? Jesus said, no, no, no. They gave out of all their abundance and she gave all she had. Now, I would dare say as we took up the offering this morning, most of us were giving out of our abundance, right? Rather than all we had. Now, all that to say that this isn't the word Jesus used. This word has to do with penne. It has to do with working hard, okay, and just having a little that you have to really work hard for. The word Jesus actually used is the word tokus. It's not tokus. It's tokus, just so we're clear here. And it doesn't mean you've got a little. It means you have absolutely, guess, Nothing. It means absolute poverty. It means having nothing. That's the word that Jesus used here today. It's not somebody who doesn't have much, but somebody who works hard for, for a living. No, it's to have absolutely nothing. And the root of this word is somebody who, who is knelt down and cowering, and they've been so beaten by life that they just have the rounded shoulders and can hardly get up. They've got nothing left. And that's terrible. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be blessed, because become like somebody with abject poverty who has nothing at all. How do you think the disciples felt when they heard this? What? No, wait, oh, no, I don't want that. Become like that. I think think about being in Haiti, just in Haiti a month ago. And there were those people with virtually nothing, Poorest country in the world. But man, watch them come into church and worship. Wow, their worship puts us to shame, honest. They're so joyful, thankful, grateful, so expressive to God. You know, when they give their offerings, the little tiny bit that they have, here's what they do. They have an alms box right here in the middle, and they all come starting in the back row, and the music's playing, and they're dancing, and they all come up young and old. The parents will give their kids a little bit, might be two pennies, but give it, and they come dancing up and drop it into the box. They go around back to their seat. We're going to do that next week. (laughs) Why are you laughing? Maybe we should. They got nothing, but they've got joy. Why? Because they're blessed. It's inside, though they have almost nothing on the outside. Kind of ironic, isn't it? The people with less are happier in some ways. My, why? Because their foundation is blessing, blessedness from God. Now, I want to be clear here. This is one of the most mis- quoted verses in the Bible, because everybody says, blessed are the poor. And that is not what Jesus said here. What does he say? What is the meaning of poor in spirit? 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. He doesn't say blessed are the poor. I mean, truly, if it was, if you're blessed by being poor, we should not help anybody out who's starving because we're taking away their blessing. Does that make sense? Seriously, if you're blessed by being poor, just, just poor, materially poor, we shouldn't give any, we should actually, you know, give everything away ourselves, which maybe we should, but that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, that's a little bit different. Actually, that's a lot different, isn't it? So this means, like I said, being poverty-stricken in spirit, in spirit instead. It's spiritual things. It's not, it's not having nothing physically and material. It's having nothing, knowing that you have nothing spiritually that God needs, that can buy favor from God at all. Blessed are the people who are poverty-stricken in spirit. Now, the, the Hebrews, back in the day, the Hebrews had a saying that when a man became poor, he lost all his prestige. And when a man loses his prestige, he loses his power. And if he loses his power, he loses his influence on other people. Till he, become, he comes to the place where all he can do is throw himself on God. Hmm. Wow. Blessed is the man who, not materially, but spiritually, recognizing that, recognizes that apart from God, I have nothing. There's the key, folks. You got it? Blessed are the poor in spirit, the ones that realize that I have nothing to give to God that he needs. Nothing that I can give to God to buy my way into his family, to buy my way into heaven. Nothing. I got nothing valuable for eternity apart from Jesus and what he did. I, I stand before God and I say, hey, I'm Brian Magnus. And he says, so? Yeah. I've got no power to influence God. Nothing. I'm poor in spirit. Now, if you want to be blessed by God, realize that you've got nothing to give to God for eternity. Nothing. Now, I'm not talking about have a poor self-image. Oh, I'm such a worm. Oh, I'm so terrible. That's not it at all. Actually, our self-image and our self-worth should come from our relationship with God and knowing the God who made us. Amen? That's where our, relation, our foundation ought to be with God anyway. So trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. And I'll stand before God one day with no power, no claim to fame, no prestige, just Jesus as my bridge to heaven. Amen? That's what poor in spirit means. To be blessed, to be contented beyond our circumstances, it's the person who is, who in his spirit recognizes the poverty of his soul apart from God's provision in Jesus and what Jesus did. So now how does this work? Because I still have a house and a car and some money to buy groceries and whatnot. I, I still have all those things, right? So how does that work? How do I live in poverty, poverty stricken, and, and yet live in our society today the way we have to live? How does that work? Well, there's a key that the Bible says all over the place, cover to cover, which I think we don't catch all the time, but this is an ideal time to look at it because blessedness is found through stewardship. True blessedness is found through stewardship. How do, I mean, how do I navigate life and all the stuff and what I need? We all need to have money, don't we? I mean, we have to. It's something we have to have. So how do I handle that? How do I handle all these things? Well, blessedness is found through stewardship. Now, stewardship means what? I'm not the owner I'm just the caretaker, right? I'm not the owner. I'm just the steward. I, I take care of someone else's stuff. That's stewardship. So who is the owner? Let me ask again. Who is the owner? And who is the steward? Me. The stuff I have is God's stuff. Indeed, our very lives... See what Paul says to the Corinthians? You are not, don't you know? He says, don't you know that you are not your own? You're bought at a price. What's the price? Jesus' blood shed on the cross, the highest price. That's how much he loves us. It's kind of amazing. Now think about it. What are some of the things that give you a sense of security? Maybe even a sense of clout or significance. What are some of those things that we have today? How about our financial security? 
Is that important? Sure. But we need to give it to God. How about our health? Okay, we, we've got a robust body, some of us more than others, right? I mean, honestly, could your health be taken from you tomorrow? So if your happiness, your security, all that is based on your health, could be up, could be down. Oh, my goodness. There are people, folks, that's, that's happiness when it's based on even just your health. There are people, as you know, who are weak and sickly and have weary bodies, yet they have a peace and contentment that just surprises you. I visited so many in the hospital like that. See, that's blessedness. Even though my body's not doing what it used to do, I don't bounce back as quickly as I once did. My hair is not, you know, jet black like it once was. At least I have hair. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thankful for the blessings, right? Okay, how about this? How about your home and everything you own? Could it go tomorrow? Could it? Could it burn down tomorrow? Yeah. How about your business? Could it go bankrupt next week? How about your investments? Could the stock market crash? Some people are predicting that, that we're about to hit a recession again. How about that? How about, how about the one you love? Could she or he be taken from you soon? When I'm finding, I'm looking for happiness. When my life is about happiness, it's about all these things that make me happy, but when they're gone, I'm not happy. It's not what God wants for us. These things are great, and we need money and a shelter and people to love us. Those are great, but that's not where blessing lies. Those things bring happiness when they're there. God wants to give us blessedness, and Jesus talks about this too. If life is based on the circumstances and people around us, that's happiness as opposed to God's blessing. See, blessing is found in stewardship, not ownership. Stewardship, not ownership. And it all belongs to God anyway. All right? Everything belongs to God. So, things are not evil. They're just things. But a mature Christian recognizes that all he has is an instrument or resource for God to use in God's plan. You might think, well, what about me? Well, aren't you part of God's plan? Yes. And guess when you are especially blessed, when you actually pass along your blessings to others. You're part of God's plan to bless other people, and you get blessed as well. It's amazing stuff what God wants to do. I've had a number of people ask me to come to their homes when they've bought a new home and pray a prayer of of blessing in their home. And I've been happy to do that. That's great, you know. But I need to tell you, you don't need me to come to your home to pray. My prayers are no better than your prayers. All right? Should you, when you get a new home, pray and say, God, Thank you for this home. This is your home. Help me to use it with generosity and hospitality. And and it's yours. Should we pray that? And more than just a one-time prayer we move in, should that be our attitude towards it all the time? Yeah. And everything that we have, everything that we have, that is stewardship. God, this is your place. This is your place. So when it burns down, you say, God, where's your other place? because he'll have another place. I got a little chart for you if you want to turn the page over, okay? As we talk about blessings found in stewardship, uh, am I looking to be blessed so I'm poor in spirit, or am I looking for ownership, which is kind of proud in spirit? This is mine, right? I mean, boy, when we think of ownership, there's a sense of pride in there, and it's okay on a certain level, right? It's okay on a certain level. I'm, I'm proud. Look at my flower beds, and, you know, that's fine. But again, if that's security, if that's who you want to be at your foundation, there's trouble. Now, let's look at these things and unpack them for a moment. If you're poor in spirit, if it's about stewardship, then you're blessed because you don't own anything. It's God's. You don't have to worry about it. But if you're proud in spirit, it's about you owning and what's yours, then you're going to be seeking happiness through ownership. And then it's, it's mine and, and I need more. I need to own more and have more. If you're poor in spirit, 
It's blessedness. You're, you have a secure foundation because your foundation isn't your bank account or your house or your car. Your foundation is Jesus. Indeed, Paul says, no foundation can anyone lay other than who? Jesus Christ. Now, again, if you're proud in spirit, it's about you and what you have in your ownership, then you're going to have an unstable foundation because you could lose those things easily and quickly. True? If you're poor in spirit, you're going to be seeking God's gigantic kingdom and how everything that I happen to have right now is part of God's big plan. But if you're proud in spirit, you're just seeking your own kingdom. The world becomes smaller because it's just about you and yourself and what you have and as opposed to what's bigger and what God wants. If you're looking for blessedness, and it's stewardship, it's all God's, you'll be released from threats because it's not yours. It's not yours. You can't threaten me. I don't, it's not mine anyway. But if you're proud in spirit, it's about what you have and your ownership. There are threats from the changing circumstances and what will the stock market do and what's happening with my investments or whatever. Could I lose my job? We have people losing jobs and looking for jobs here in our family. If I'm poor in spirit, I am learning that God's love casts out fear. I'm learning God's love casts out fear, and I can live in love and in courage. But again, if it's about ownership and I'm proud in spirit, I'm learning that lives, I'm living my life in fear of losing it all. And my love is limited because I could lose it quickly and any time. And it's just tough. I'll have a limited ability to love. If you own nothing... Christ can be the center, much more easily, the center of your life. And Jesus can be the focus in his kingdom. Because you could say, it's not mine, it's his. It's his house, it's his car. And you can see things from his point of view. It's not my will, it's his. And you can be released from ownership. Quick question. Who has the most headaches the employees or the owner? Now, all the employees think, oh, you don't know the headaches I have. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know the answer to that, then uh, you need to uh, become an owner someday because with ownership comes all kinds of headaches and pressures that just aren't there for stewards or employees. Give it to God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You've given it to God. Now, does he let you drive it? Yes. And live in it? And spend it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if it's God's, wow, I don't have those pressures. I have a lot of responsibilities here in our church as a pastor. And sometimes it can be tough. It can be overwhelming when there's you know, lots of things going on. And, and uh, I seriously, one of the things I have to tell myself all the time is, God, this is your church, not mine. I, yes, I've got responsibilities, but ultimately, these are your people that you love and you want me to do what I can and not carry the burden you know, that would weigh me down because it's your church. They're your people. And, and, and you'll use far more people than just me to minister to the needs in our church. Amen? It's the same principle. Same principle with our house, with, our, with everything that we have. Do we recognize that we're just stewards or do we think it's mine, 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 and we're no longer poor or poor in spirit, so God can bless us. Well, let's close. One more thing. What is the promised blessing for those who are poor in spirit? Well, it's the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, say it with me, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I love that. Blessed are the people who are poor, impoverished, with nothing spiritually, because, ironically, they're the ones who get it all. Wow, wow. The people who have no spiritual goods to offer God and know that they're just giving everything to God, okay? Those are the people who will get everything, the kingdom of God. But those who are building their own kingdom, all of their self is going into life now, and all they have is now. That's all they have. Those who let go of their pride recognize that before God they'll stand with nothing, they get everything, everything, the whole kingdom of heaven. Now, let me show you this. Here's what Jesus said. Got your notes? 
he gives two verses later in Matthew that talk about this kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let's have a look and read. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a, a what? Treasure, okay? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, you know, stumbles across it, like, whoa, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and did what? Sold some of what he had? Sold most of what he had? Sold all that he had and bought that field. Why? Because it was a great treasure worth all, everything else that he had paled in comparison to this treasure, right? So it's worth selling all he had for this treasure. It's amazing. And you know what the treasure is? It's Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom. That's the treasure. I, I, I want that. I mean, can you invest a substantial amount and have it? No, he had to sell all that he had. Well, wait, wait. How much does it cost? Exactly everything you have. Yeah, but then I'll have nothing. Yes, but you'll have Jesus. Look at verse 45. Same thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of, what? Great value, he went away and, what? Yes, sold part, most, everything that he had and bought it. So let me ask you this. Have you, have you come to a cheap Jesus? Have you come to a cheap Jesus or one worth everything? Is your eternity and salvation something cheap or did it cost Jesus everything. Yeah, my goodness. And you could say, Jesus, everything I have, my abilities, my talents, the, the things that I hold, I just want to give it all to you so that I can have you. And if you had to choose between everything in the world around you and Jesus, which would you choose? I mean, how many of us could say, Jesus, I would give you everything I've got just to have you. That's it, folks. And if you can't say that, well, then you haven't come to grips with the road to real blessing yet. And you don't know what God's kingdom is all about. See, this is a, a self-portrait of Jesus. These, these Beatitudes, they're all Jesus. And there are mature believers are growing into them as well. And, and let me show you. Let me go to Philippians 2, which is actually, hey, this is actually a song that the early church sang. But here's how it starts. You must have the same attitude that Christ had, and then the song begins. And Paul writes this, puts it in. He says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Nothing. Literally, the Greek word is, he emptied himself. And of course, when you empty a bucket, what's in it? Nothing. What did he empty himself of? Well, all the attributes of God that aren't compatible with humanity, right? God is everywhere. Jesus limited himself to what? One body, right? I mean, God is all-powerful. Jesus limited himself to just the, the power that a human body would have. He emptied himself of all that. For who? For, for us, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Why? Why did he do that? Look, made himself nothing. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death where? On a cross. Why? And I love this. Because when Jesus, we're talking about blessedness, poor in spirit, emptied ourselves, give it all to him. When Jesus emptied himself for the Father, what did God do? So therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, 
heaven, earth, under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Because Jesus gave his everything to God, the Father exalted him. And he'll never, Jesus will never ask you to do anything that he wouldn't or hasn't done himself. He emptied himself. He gave up everything for us. And to be poor in spirit means we realize that spiritually we have nothing and everything belongs to him. And oh, the blessedness to know that if it comes or goes, I still have Jesus. If this comes, my health, even my family, if they come or go, I mean, not to be casual about it, but I still have Jesus. I still have eternity. And if those people believed as well, I'll even see them again. Praise God. Well, there's God's message to us this morning. Simply, do you want God's blessing of self-contained joy and having him in your life? Or do you want happiness from stuff? What do you think? It's up to you. Say yes or no. That's up to you. I mean, do you want God's blessing more than you want happiness? Well, then, the way to God's blessing is to take a vow of poverty. Bum, bum, bum. Now, we're not a cult here or anything like that, but I think it's appropriate this morning for us to say, God, as I'm reminded today, as I see that this is, out of the eight, the foundational step one to being blessed is to know that it all belongs to you. I have nothing, nothing that you need or want, nothing that can buy my way into heaven, and even this stuff is yours. To remind ourselves by taking a vow of poverty. Are you ready? Let's pray. Lord, a lot of us didn't come here this morning to hear this, but we come to you not claiming our rights, our power, our privileges based on who and what we are. We come to you to make a vow of poverty, poor in spirit. So I wonder, folks, while your heads are bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if you would pray this prayer to God with me. Lord Jesus, you can pray it in your head if you want. Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. I give my house to you. I give my net worth to you. I give my car to you. I give my business to you. I give my savings to you. I give my health to you. I give my loved ones to you. Because what I want most is you. And Lord, when we have you, and realize that you own us and everything else, we are blessed inside, no matter what happens on the outside. And we say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.